Thank you. Uh, before I start on my talk, I just wanted to do a really quick ad for something that's coming up in Wisconsin. The Northern Nut Growers Association uh, will be doing their annual conference. It's apparently their 106th annual conference in La Crosse from July 26th to 29th. Uh, and there will be information posted on the after website. So if any of you are interested in nut, nut trees of any kind or hazelnuts, um, and we'll also have a presentation on perennial polycultures, keep that in mind. All right, about my talk. So about, I, uh, for the past 20 years, I've been working in sustainable agriculture, uh, working to just kind of provide information about sustainable agriculture to people in Extension, people in NRCS, other uh, people in soil and water conservation. Um, and about five years ago, I personally became extremely interested in agroforestry, so much so that I decided to return <coughs> to grad school and do some, some research on how I could maybe look into whether silvopasture was a good practice for Wisconsin and, and what issues we needed to solve and how we could promote it. Uh, after this long time in sustainable agriculture, one of the core tenets of that is always ask your farmers first. So as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to do something in silvopasture. I also knew I wanted to start out by asking the people who would have to be involved what they thought about it. Uh, and before I get into the details of, of what I found out, I do want to thank my advisor, Mark Rickenbach, who's a, a forester and also a social scientist. And I also want to uh, thank Keith Keeley, and you'll be hearing from him later today, but Keith has kind of been about a year ahead of me in his inquiries, and so I've learned a lot from him, and uh, it's been great working together. So what's the current situation? We have the statistics from the agricultural census, and I pulled the statistics for Wisconsin, of course, because that's where I'm from, and that's what my primary interest is but also from the surrounding states. And one of the questions that the ag, the ag Census, which is conducted every five years, asks is about land use. And so there are a whole bunch of farms in all these upper Midwestern states that have woodlands on their farms. And of the farms that have woodlands, this chart shows the percentage that uh, of those woodlands that are grazed. So it ranges from about 14% in Illinois, Illinois, no, actually Michigan is just about 9%, just under 10%, to about 30% in Minnesota. So we do know that there's woodland grazing going on. We don't know much about what is going on there. Um, we do know in the most recent ag census, they did ask a combined question uh, whether farms are, producing, are, are, do, are practicing either alley cropping or silvopasture. And just for example, in Wisconsin, there's a, over 11,000 farms that are grazing uh, woodlands, and 109 farms responded that they were doing either silvopasture or alley cropping. So those are the statistics we know. We don't really know the details of what that means. This is the current or this has been the policy in Wisconsin, certainly since the 1950s and, and earlier than that, there was a lot of research from the 30s to the 50s about how harmful woodland grazing is, how cows can you know, beat up the woods, uh, compact the soil, prevent regeneration. So this is actually a publication from the 50s, but this is still what farmers are being told today. Don't put your cows in the woods. Woods pastures don't pay, um, all of that. You're probably all familiar with that. But we have an interesting angle on that in Wisconsin, which is that our property taxes tell farmers, well, you can pay one property tax level for woods that are managed as woods with no livestock in them, and you can reduce your property taxes by 90% or more if you graze them, because then they will be agricultural land use, and you get the special agricultural land use um, tax rate. And not only raise them, but the specific language in there says something along the lines of, or says, that's a correct quote, the undergrowth and wood pasture will be raised down, allowing the livestock to roam freely under the tree canopy. And what does that mean? Does that mean it has to be overgrazed to qualify? We don't really know, you know, that's legislative language, so there's a lot of interpretation there. Anyway, 
So that's kind of the situation that I walked into. Um, and so I wanted to ask people what they think. And so I, I just did three focus groups, pretty modest uh, thing, and that's what I'll be talking about today. To get to the focus groups, I also did some individual interviews with uh, people who were sort of my informal advisory committee. And so some of that kind of informed how I recruited the focus groups and uh, also the very open-ended questions that we asked. And the focus groups had the, two of the focus groups were what I call resource professionals, um, some of whom are also farmers, but they're primarily, they have jobs as either extension agents or foresters or um, other environmental planners. And then we had one farmer focus group. And Keith was my co-conspirator with those two. So what did we learn from the focus groups? So I explain a little bit about what these, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about on these tables, but what you see here is I've lumped together the, the what we learned in the focus groups from the professionals, um, and then there's the farmer focus group on the other side. Um, coding, I don't know how many of you have done qualitative research, coding's a process where you hear what the people have done and you put them in categories. And I did, uh, Grounded coding, which meant I didn't have preconceived categories. I just listened to the text and sort of um, kind of noted down what people were saying and created categories out of what they said. So there weren't, our questions in the beginning were very open-ended. We didn't ask them, say, um, you know, in, in your current practices, uh, is Savannah restoration a thing that you're trying to do? This is kind of what they volunteered. And one of the things I really want to draw your attention to is one of the things that I think was striking is the similarity in terms of the top issues that the farmers and the professionals have. Um, so not always the same amount of emphasis. The number of letters is sort of how many times it was kind of a major topic of conversation. And just another thing, A means it was an ag professional, E means it was an environmental professional, and F means it was a forester. So in some cases, um, you know, the foresters were the only people saying something, in some cases, only the ag professionals. Um, so anyway, current practices, everybody knew about, everybody said woods grazing is happening, and that's, we know that's happening from looking at these, the statistics. Um, and they mentioned various reasons for it. Taxes was one of them that was mentioned by all the focus groups. Um, and then the other thing is, just the, the, the fact that professionals mentioned that they didn't know tree planting and pastures was partly an artifact that I asked them what did they know was going on, whereas farmers were just talking about themselves, so they wouldn't say when they're talking about their own practices, I don't know of tree planting pastures. So that's one area where there's a difference, but it's a difference that reflects the question. Again, and I think this is interesting, farmers had all touched on all the main concerns that environmental professionals <coughs> touched on. And I think this is important because um, really one of the big uh, divides uh, between people, and, and someone else mentioned this in the, on the sort of pre-conference, is the foresters and the ag uh, community are a little suspicious of each other. And I think that this is important, this is something that we, I can then go back and share with the forestry community, because one of the things that I did get in the, in the focus group was one of, one of the foresters saying over and over again, are farmers, do farmers even care about these things? And they're certainly aware of them. They don't always view them in the same way. But they care about invasive species. They care about tree form. Sometimes they want the other tree form. They want the open ground tree form as opposed to the straight upright tree form. Um, they care about erosion. They care about damage to trees. So I think that was that was an important finding. <clears throat> Benefits. Uh, again, they pretty much uh, came up with the same grouping of benefits. Um, <clears throat> The farmers didn't mention winter shelter, um, so that would be if, I, if we have an opportunity to do a few more focus groups, see if that comes up in some of the other focus groups. Um, but uh, so one of the things, the, the two, the two things that were really the things that people talked about a lot, well, three things people talked about a lot in all the focus groups uh, were the importance of shade. And that was primarily something that the farmers and the agricultural professionals recognized. Um, and uh, the importance of invasives, uh, use the, the potential to use silver pasture to manage invasives was of great interest. And then for many people, Savannah, 
uh, restoration was of great interest. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And this was a surprise. All the other things we've seen before were things that, you know, that those are in the literature, those are kind of things that common sense would tell you might pop up as um, concerns or benefits from, from some of the pastor. This was a huge theme, again, in all three focus groups. People were very worried about the uh, influence of land tenure. In this particular part of the state where we conducted this, uh, there is a lot of um, second home ownership, and uh, there, was, there was a lot of discussion about that. The agricultural professionals in particular felt that with a perennial system like silver pasture and with the requirement for um, the intense management that grazing management requires, that that would be a big barrier. Farmers viewed it slightly differently. They were concerned about land tenure and land access issues, but they also talked about the potential for silva pasture to be a way for farmers who didn't have much land base uh, to use silva pasture as a land management tool and get access to land that's owned by these um, for recreational purposes for second home ownership for, for people who don't have the livestock management skills. And so there's just one quote of many, many quotes that talked about the, the importance of land tenure. And that's also something to keep in mind. We always, you know, or I know I do, and I, from what I've heard, people have talked about owner-operator situations, but that's not always going to be the case. Uh, for information needed, that was one question we asked, you know, what information do you need? And so again, um, there was there was a quite a bit of consensus there uh, and, and really strong uh, from both groups, even though there's only one there that was just a, a very strong, passionate statement that you need that and nods around the table, um, that you need you need to show us. You need to put it on the land here in Wisconsin so we can see it, um, and, and you know then we'll know how we can proceed forward. So that's the most important information thing was not specific <coughs> questions, but just trying it out. Um, other things that, that we would expect, economics were very important to the farmers, um, but also perceived as important by the professionals. Um, and uh, management of invasives was, was very important. So management recommendations. I think the, the highlighted ones um, were for going forward that, that we have, I think, a lot of sort of consensus in it. And again, it's not a surprise, um, but it, it's good to know that the people we talk to who agree with this um, really need to manage the grazing. How you do the grazing is critical. Um, and then the other thing that really came out strongly and that I want to highlight is that the site selection is important. And this was particularly um, important for balancing those, you know, the, the concerns of the foresters in, in the group. They're very, they're, they were willing to listen, they're, but they're very cautious. They, they don't want a discussion of silver pasture to result in more wood, woods grazing. Um, but on the other hand, they know that people are grazing their woods already, although they attribute it all to the tax policy, which is perhaps a little naive. Um, and so they're willing in those areas that are already degraded or already being grazed there, they're willing to move forward. And so that's an important area of consensus. And this was an important thing that came out. Uh, this was a comment one person made actually quite early in the focus group discussion, but then it was echoed by a number of people later. And basically what he was saying is, this is, this is a really good thing to talk about. We haven't been able to talk about it. You know, we've always been telling people you can't put your cows in the woods. And on the other hand, they're doing it for economic reasons or for whatever reasons we have. And because we've said you absolutely can't do this, we've had no way to move forward on that. You know, we've had no way to improve the management of that. Uh, so, so I think that overcoming that taboo is very important. And I think the focus groups were actually a very good way to start overcoming that taboo. All right, so I said I would come back to Savannah Restoration. This was a very important goal for the farmers, for the environmental people, um, and uh, for the ag professionals. And so here's a 
one of many quotes saying that there are quite a few landowners who are interested in supporting um, savanna restoration and that silvopasture can be, a, you know, can potentially be a good tool to do that because fire is very expensive, it's dangerous, it requires special skills um, where silvopasture could actually produce income. And, you know, an agricultural professional uh, had a strong thing about saying, you know, this was a very important original habitat in this part of the state. And so, you know, harkening back to that, that this is a habitat that's endangered, we need restoration. But the forester viewpoint was a little bit different, saying, well, this land can grow trees. You know, the fact that it was savanna and settlement was a result of management or by, possibly by, you know, well, he said, there, there was so much grassland here is because it was so heavily burned by the native population. This, this land grows trees if it is not heavily disturbed or burned. So there's a different, you know, there's, there's certainly different attitudes that we have to take into account as we move forward. So woodland grazing is the, is the gorilla in the room. I went into the civil pasture thinking we're gonna be talking about planting trees in pasture, but that's not the dominant thing in, in um, Wisconsin. We have to address this, this issue of woodland grazing. And I think we have to overcome this taboo on talking about woodland grazing at all because it's inhibiting knowledge exchange. The farmers talked a lot in the focus group about different things they did in terms of, of grazing management and in terms of um, you know, what the potentials were, what the dangers were, but they're not generally allowed to share that and they're certainly the environmental professionals felt that they weren't allowed to share that information in the current context. There's a range of attitudes, but there is, there's potential to move forward. So we are moving forward with a bunch of um, research demonstration sites, um, and but equally important, I think we really want to maintain that conversation and we're trying to build a network. We have a listserv and uh, we're, we've started to do some um, talks and they've been very well received, very well attended. And another thing I want to say is that the, the candid conversation that could go on in these focus groups where people weren't in public has been very different from the kinds of comments I've heard at, at field days or at conferences. And I think that's an important thing I want to maintain going forward. People will speak because of this taboo, they may speak more openly, be more comfortable in that kind of situation. And the work for doing the focus groups was sponsored by the Kickapoo Valley Reforestation Fund. And at this point, uh, do we have time for questions? We do. We've got five minutes for questions. All right. How much of the driving force uh, is taxes, property taxes, in making decisions on whether you uh, graze the woodlands or just leave it in woodlands? And does anybody really check the tax appraisal? The, so the tax assessors do check, apparently. Yeah, the question. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, the question was, how much of a driving force is the tax policy in terms of uh, encouraging woodland grazing? Yeah, for the wood, I mean, the landowner to make a decision. For the landowner to make a decision. And then do, do assessors actually check whether, check whether the woods are being grazed? Yeah. That's a good question. I don't have definitive answers on either one. The perception within Wisconsin is definitely that the tax policy is an important driver. Um, there are also farmers who, despite the tax policy, feel strongly protecting their woodlands. So, you know, it's only, I think it was something like 19% of farm woodlands are grazed. Now, maybe some of those are, are farms that, where the farmers don't own livestock, but there are farmers who own livestock who won't graze their woodlands. But the, the fact is, um, so people from surrounding states, I know there are people here from Minnesota. In Minnesota, do you get a tax break for grazing your woodlands? No. Minnesota's higher. Minnesota's at 30% of grazed woodlands. So it's the highest one of all those states we looked at, and you don't get a tax break. So there's more going on than just that. And farmers did mention shade as being very important, and also, they see that livestock as clearing out the brush. Uh, they, you know, so much of these woodlands were grazed at one point, so they're not intact woodlands, you know, and so they have a very brushy understory filled with multiflora rose and prickly ash and honeysuckle. And one way to deal with that is to 
put you in life cycle. Well, so, you know, you can, you know, I've found <coughs> talking to the American Tree Farm group that you can file an agri, you treat it, agroforestry is same, is same as a management plan for land for, for forestry. So shouldn't the tax group take a plan for, which may be agroforestry, is still a forestry project? Oh, you mean to have agroforestry seen as an agricultural practice? As it is a management practice, practice right. and not saying that I'm going to do grazing. It's you're growing trees for a specific reason. Yeah, and I mean, that's part of your management plan. You could be grazing trees out there, you're going to cut down while at the same time you're grazing the undergrowth. Yeah, there have been lots of proposals to change the tax policy and uh, in the current tax environment, where it, I'll talk to you about that later, but the current tax environment in Wisconsin is lo local government is struggling to get tax revenue. So they're going to be very reluctant to see any other tax breaks come in. But there's a question way in the back there. You don't mind me making kind of a comment, a comment yeah. slash question. The tax rates in Wisconsin on this are at use rate for the ag side, which this price might be $2. Or if it's under the farm building thing, it's half of whatever building rate right. is, which is maybe forty dollars. So they're paying twenty bucks. Or if it's a managed forest law, uh, it's like ten dollars, maybe six cents or something. Right. There's a lot of. I mean, I know quite a number of people that when the tax the tax assessors actually reclassified it as woodland as opposed to ag ground, but they actually clearly put it in front because it they did not want to pay forty dollars. There's corners of pivot systems that are in alfalfa now and not trees because they don't want to pay taxes on them. So I think the taxes is significant for driving. But as you said, sometimes, I mean, grazing of woodlands might be less of a long term impact than knocking it, you know, cutting it all down or dozing it, and putting it in your pivot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, in Texas, they don't, there's not a distinction between the two, between whether you're in forestry. Or in That's a pretty big one in this Yeah, well, it's like dying again, everyone.